Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce Ingrid Mabrillo Solis, and she'll be speaking on dynamics of the phase transition in liquid crystals, what persistent homology reveals. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to speak in this seminar, and thank you to all of you for attending this talk. So I'm going to uh, talk about some uh, research done in collaboration with uh, Tatiana Orlova, uh, Piotr Lesak, Karolina Betnarska, uh, Tomasz Wulinski, Jean Paolo Alessandro, Jacek Broski, and Malgosia Kaczmarek. Um, so this is the plan for the talk. So I'm going to start a, a talking a bit about the physics behind uh, liquid crystals. Then after that, I will try to give uh, an idea of what the motivation behind this uh, research uh, were, uh, and also what the goals uh, of this project was, were. And, um, and also I will introduce this uh, persistent homology-based framework that we uh, proposed to study liquid crystal dynamics. And at the end, I will uh, uh, present the results for a, a particular case that we uh, study um, using our framework in the case of the phase transition in liquid crystals. So then let's start. So, okay, so the first question obviously is what is a liquid crystal? So a liquid crystal is just a state of matter which has symmetry and physical properties which are intermediate between those of a solid crystal and liquid. So for instance, in here you can find a, a, a here you have a picture in which we have in an image of a solid crystal. So you can see it is very ordered. So it, the arrangement of the, in this case, for instance, molecules that form this liquid crystal is well-defined. And there is a periodic arrangement of this uh, in this uh, crystal. And the other hand, for instance, in the case of a liquid, we have that the molecules are not, uh, do not present a particular uh, arrangement. So there is no orientation or periodicity at all. And in between, we have this liquid crystal in which basically uh, one of the, uh, the main, uh, the common characteristic of any liquid crystal is that all of them will present, uh, will uh, prefer orientation. Uh, they will be oriented with respect to some direction. Um, so, so liquid crystal can be found as a single chemical compound or as a mixture of two or, or more chemical compounds. And so, for instance, in this case, when the when the uh, the molecular arrangement of the liquid crystal depends on the temperature, then we say that it's a thermotropic liquid crystal, and the, uh, they can present the different degrees of order in the molecular arrangement. So, for instance, uh, in the case of the thermotropic, usually we have four a uh, liquid crystal uh, mesophases, uh, which are pneumatic, smectic, cholesteric, and columnar. And of course, all of them, if we hit, for instance, enough the liquid crystal, then all the nice properties of what makes them to be a liquid crystal are uh, banished. So they become basically, they behave like a li liquid. And that state is called the isotropic state. All right, so um, one of the, uh, this, this kind of like a, a, a intermediate a state between being a solid crystal and a liquid, gives these liquid crystals a, a special property. So they are going to be a, present a, an isotropy of optical, electrical, and magnetic properties. So an isotropy means that when we measure a, a property, a, the, that, the value of that property will depend on the direction in which we are measuring, the, the, taking this measurement on, on that property. So basically because of this uh, preferred orientation of the molecules is that they present this anisotropy in these uh, physical properties. And of course, this is what makes the liquid crystal so uh, interesting for applications. So for instance, of course, probably most of us have heard of liquid crystal because they appear nowadays in as uh, one of the main components of display devices technology, like our screens, computer screens or smartphones. But also nowadays they have very nice applications in biomedicine and nanotechnology. So here I'm just showing a picture for pictures of liquid crystals in which, for instance, in the, uh, this picture that I'm showing here, do you see my pointer? Yeah, okay. So here we have the pneumatic uh, state mesophase. And in this picture, we have the smectic uh, mesophase. And in between, we have all these uh, kind of like transition 
So that experience are the liquid crystal when we uh, increase the temperature. So um, the, this, the fact that they produce, uh, they have these optical properties is what make uh, these sometimes these um, the systems uh, attractive for, for applications in technology. Okay, so now uh, regarding the uh, phase transitions in liquid crystals, uh, so basically uh, in, they will correspond to some kind of breaking of asymmetry in the, in the system. And this breaking of symmetry is described in terms of a, a two symmetric tensor, which is called the order parameter uh, Q, which is, uh, uh, has zero traits. And basically this order parameter is a local parameter. So in which uh, if we, for instance, consider a small volume in our liquid, our liquid crystal, so we can take the average of all the uh, vectors along uh, all the uh, long, uh, uh, main axis of our molecules. So for instance, the molecules in the um, liquid crystal might have in general, either the, the, the shape of a disc or the shape of a road. So in this case, well, these ellipses try to represent like a molecule which has a road like shape. And, and then uh, so we, we can take the average of all these, uh, um, the unitary vectors along the, the main axis of these molecules. And this will define what is called the director. And if we take, for instance, any other, um, for instance, any other uh, uh, measure, the, uh, they will define an angle between any molecule in this volume. And basically this angle is the one that is, will be, um, they will, will uh, define our uh, order parameter, which in this case is a tensor. Um, but also uh, when we try to uh, represent uh, the phase transition, in, uh, not just using uh, order parameters, but in some cases it would be important to take into account the, uh, the, the, uh, so that the liquid crystals are basically, a, a, we, we have to put it inside some, for instance, plates or some capillary, or they will be living inside some boundaries. And the interaction between the molecules and the boundaries will be also important. So in some cases, for instance, the molecules might align along a parallel to, for instance, plates that I as in this picture, or in some cases also the molecules can be, will prefer to uh, align perpendicular to, to the, the, uh, this, the interface between the liquid crystal and the, and the plate. So all these kind of uh, situations need to be considered when we want to understand the, the phase transition in liquid crystals. And well, one of the uh, generic models to um, model the thermodynamical potential is, uh, can be expressed in this form, in which uh, here G is just a thermodynamical potential, say for instance, the, the, ener the free energy. Uh, G and free energy, uh, G in naught will represent the uh, thermodynamical potential in the isotropic phase. And here we will have an expansion in, in powers of, uh, of the, our order parameter, well, the trace of the order parameter. But well, so this is kind of a generic kind of uh, thermodynamical potential. Of course, in this, this uh, expression in, it's not going to be uh, accurate for all kinds of liquid crystals. So we need to, to add maybe in some cases more factors or need to take into consideration other kind of, uh, for instance, potential associated to, to the system. But well, this is one of the, 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 the theories uh, or one of the, the expressions in which uh, people can start uh, uh, studying the, uh, dynamics of the liquid crystal. Uh, in terms of experiments, so one of the things that people try to, to do uh, first when we anal they analyze the phase transition is uh, obtain the transition temperatures. And this can be done by two different methods, so dynamical method or uh, a static method. And, and uh, Ingrid, can I interrupt really quickly? Yes. There's a question from the uh, prior slide. Um, yeah. Slide six, yeah. Does the use of point indicate a point in, in 3D? Sorry, sorry? Does the Say use this? of point indicate a point in 3D? In here, in point, transition point. I'm not sure, it's, it's not my question, but maybe Thomas, if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, well, I mean, transition point, I mean, yes. Oh, I mean, it's kind of like a, a 
there will be some critical points in the thermodynamical potential and then that will be basically what uh, at some point in some kind of high surface which it will depend on the um, order parameter right right so it's probably a higher dimensional yeah yeah, yeah exactly. higher, higher dimensional energy surface and you're looking at yeah exactly yeah so yeah. higher dimensional energy surface yeah thanks uh so here i'm sorry could i so it's a value within the domain of this function and this yeah. value yeah. is some yeah, that can be can be a value or can be for instance yes so in some cases it depends on how your thermodynamical potential is but yes uh in general you think that it might be just a point it's a critical point say of your of your thermodynamical potential but what i'm trying to understand is is a point in some place in r to the end for some n or is it just a scalar value or some other is, is no, it point here no, informal no, or is it actually yeah, a geometric point? point which then depends on the um so the uh say configuration space of the of this uh, liquid crystal system yeah so every every uh, thermodynamical potential well here can, we can think of it as a like define it over some abstract configuration space and they might be uh, define it as a zone maybe in manifold or something like that yeah okay thank you yeah so uh as i mentioned then uh so here we can have the different methods so one of the methods that we uh, people try to use commonly is the dynamical methods in basically we uh they put the uh, liquid crystal inside some uh a, say for instance a capillary or in, in the middle in between two plates they put it in, in uh, over a, a hot plate and then they observe uh, through an optical microscope this uh, the change in the texture of the in the liquid crystal so when they detect the first you know uh, change then they take note of that time and that temperature and then they keep like observing until the the texture becomes completely homogeneous so in some cases, of course, this is not very accurate. And also it cannot be detected because it depends on the observer. And also it depends on how much the texture is changing and that we, you know, like we are really able to, to look at all these slightly changes. But yeah, but this is one of the methods that people can use. And, uh, and well, uh, the idea is that if we want to really understand, try to understand how a uh, liquid crystal behaves uh, and, and for instance in a phase transition or in any other kind of like a, um, a dynamical process we need to for instance model we would like to uh, model uh, the behavior around the vicinity of a phase transition because there there's some interesting things are ha happens so we need to really be careful to look at the vicinity of this phase transition because in that way, so we want that uh, our thermodynamical potential in the end allows us to predict the behavior of the system in any kind of condition. Um, all right, so this was a brief uh, introduction to uh, liquid crystals. And now let's go to the second part of the talk, which is uh, basically presenting our framework. Okay, so um, as uh, well, in general, studying liquid crystals, either experimentally or theoretical, theoretically, it's very challenging. So it's not because of these properties of liquid crystals, which are lying in between being a solid and being a liquid, uh, sorry, a, a solid crystal and a liquid that makes them very difficult to model. And uh, so that, however, we know that uh, they have very nice properties like optical properties, which somehow uh, makes us think that can be really suitable to, um, to be uh, studied through the lens of persistent homology. So because we know now how to handle, for instance, lots of images in a very system in a systematic way, we, uh, we think that persistent homology could be a good tool to track this uh, any structural change during a, a dynamical process of these liquid crystals. So uh, the goals in this, this work was to uh, propose a, a framework based on persistent homology to analyze the dynamics of soft condensed matter systems such as liquid crystals. So our idea was not just only indeed to apply to liquid crystal, but uh, to other soft condensed matter systems, which might have also nice optical properties, which can, can, we, can use to, we can use to uh, start it under the, the, um, our framework. Uh, so the next goal, of course, is once we propose this framework was to uh, benchmark uh, our uh, uh, method. 
so that we can see that we, we really compare with a, a, well, a known system and, and see how our method works. And then after that, analyze the, uh, the phase transition of a, a system in which things are not known. So, well, basically these are our, uh, our goals. And so let's start to say something about this uh, framework. So the idea is very, very general and maybe it's, uh, yeah, it's very simple. So the idea is that uh, we know that and somehow our liquid crystal will have associated some maybe unknown thermodynamical potential and that everything that happens, so all the dynamical process will, will live in there. In, so the, the, we, our system will follow some dynamical pathway in there. Um, but we maybe we might not know it, so it is there. But we, what we can get in some cases is just experimental observations. So for instance, like uh, pictures of a particular state of the system. And then what we try to do, and then is that collect all the information from this experimental observation, apply our tools from persistent homology, in which we can track in a very nice way all these uh, structural changes and quantify these structural changes. And then once we have analyzed then uh, like a feedback these models so that uh, people doing modeling can uh, uh, use this information to improve or uh, uh, add some uh, more uh, to the, new, the, the molecular models of these uh, uh, therm thermodynamics, uh, thermodynamical potentials for liquid crystal. So this is basically kind of the idea that we have in mind. And that more concrete, what we did was the following. So um, this is very simple. So, uh, so we basically, we know that um, uh, we have observations of configuration states of a liquid crystal system, which are represented by, in this case, by this picture. So we will have lots of, say, for instance, a recording of all the phase transition, and then we can take the frames of every in, in the recording so that we can have then every for every observation will be every frame will be a particular configuration state of the system. Then we will have a filtration of these images. Uh, uh, we can choose many kind of filtrations. We can choose the one that is more convenient uh, in our study, and then have uh, this will give us, of course, our topological descriptors. Uh, that then we can embed in uh, associate to us some metric, as we have plenty of metrics to to use. And then after that, we can uh, apply tools from geometry to study the phase transition pathway. And in that way, we can recover information from the, our system. So just a brief reminder of what, uh, uh, what uh, the persistent uh, homology does with images. So the idea is that uh, here we wanted to uh, obtain persistent diagrams as a topological descriptors instead of the persistent homology. We know that there is a correspondence and between these persistent diagrams and persistent homology associated to a filtration of a topological space. In this case, our images will be our topological uh, spaces uh, which can filtrate as a cubical complex. So this uh, will be a cubic, uh, cubical complex, our image, in which we associate a, a, a function, which is the pixel value intensity. And so then uh, each image will be a pixel in our image. So these this squares will be associated to a value between zero and 255. So we, of course, we need to transform, for instance, our uh, color, uh, RGB images to, for instance, say grayscale or some or, or red or some linear combination of RGB. And in here, well, then what we do then is to, uh, we fix a threshold and then we uh, construct the uh, cubical complex, which is the union of all the pixels would have intensity value less than or equal certain our defined threshold. And with that, of course, we can follow uh, what are the, uh, um, the, the uh, connected components, holes, or uh, that are appearing in our image. Okay, so um, then after that, once we have persistence, bias, then we can associate it to each image in our uh, in, in, in the phase transition process. Um, then we can associate uh, to compare um, a configuration states of the system. We can associate this uh, any uh, a metric. So we have a family of metrics given by these uh, PQ Barstein distances, and or also we can define well use uh, in, in the case when P and Q uh, the value is a, infinity. Then we have the um, the we, we obtain again the the Bopelnik distance defined in this way. 
Uh, now, if we define delta to be the empty distance diagram, we kind of have a notion of a norm of a, of a diagram given in this way. So we define the P norm of a persistent diagram to be just the distance between our diagram and the empty diagram. Yeah? And it's defined it, uh, through the uh, definition of the uh, P1 uh, Bashestein distance. Uh, okay, so uh, this was just a brief reminder of uh, persistent homology and things that we have, have been constructed to study uh, uh, data. And so now I'll just let me briefly uh, say something about geometric methods that we can apply. So basically, uh, we know that once we have a, um, a, a metric defined over the space of persistent systems, we will obtain a distance matrix. Uh, but this is just, we know that our uh, space now defined by these points will really is an uh, abstract metric space, but we would like to visualize it to study it. And of course, because what we know is how to study things in Euclidean space, then what we can do is to use some kind of uh, um, embedding method like uh, multidimensional scaling to study the properties of our um, a, a phase, tri a phase transition uh, pathway in as a, as a subspace of a Euclidean space. Of course, here we have to be very careful because in some cases the metric can be distorted. Uh, so we need to check that the distortion of the distances uh, is not that big so that we really can rely on what we are looking, uh, that the, the things that we are finding in the Euclidean space as a, as a pathway, it still remains similar to what we see in uh, what we really lives in the space of persistence diagrams. Uh, and of course, from there, that once we have this uh, embedding in Euclidean space, then we can apply other methods from uh, discrete um, geometric methods, like for instance, curvature. So for us, it was important to, for instance, study curvature because we know that our system might cross some kind of like uh, hills. So if they, if the system can uh, needs to cross through several uh, critical points, then the curvature we are thinking that the curvature at some point needs to increase. So in this case, we can also apply methods from geometry to study what happens in for in the pathway. Okay. Uh, so the curve in this case is measured in this way. So basically, we take three points in our curve and we circumscribe in a circle of radio, say, RT, uh, which depends on, on the time. And then the curvature is just defined in this case as the inverse of these radios. All right, so uh, now uh, let me then jump to uh, the, the results. Is there any question? <laughs> Sorry, I, I haven't stopped. No, okay. So then let's go to the, uh, the phase transition, uh, the, uh, the study of the phase transition in uh, pneumatic liquid crystal nanocomposite. Well, uh, so uh, here I would like to then explain a little bit the experimental setup. So this is uh, what our uh, collaborators in the Borsi University. Uh, so they um, indeed uh, studied uh, these kind of systems in order to, so the idea is to uh, study the phase transition, thinking of applications or possible applications for uh, a nanotechnology. So they try to uh, use these properties of, of liquid to create nanostructures. So for that, they, they, they um, um, form a mixture of a liquid crystal, which are represented by these pink molecules with gold nanospheres, which is this uh, yellow point. And well, here attached to this gold nanosphere are some molecules so that this, this gold nanosphere do not precipitate. So they, they tend to, to kind of uh, form clusters and then uh, precipitate, they are not dissolved. So, to prevent that, there were some molecules attached. And well, they studied to first uh, the pneumatic to isotropic phase transition, and then from there also studied the, the inverse, uh, say, uh, phase transition, so isotropic to, to pneumatic. So the, uh, the pneumatic to isotropic phase transition is going to be our benchmark uh, process to, uh, to compare or to, to kind of like a, a, a really uh, test our our uh, our framework because this is a study already was uh, analyzed through several experiments and then they, there is a, a work already uh, done on this 
And, and, and so, so the idea is to study now the isotropic tunematic to see what the information we could get. Uh, in here, the, uh, the nematic phase, uh, as I said, because the molecules are arranged in a very uh, are oriented, this nematic phase allow the, the light to be pol polarized light. So basically light, which is kind of very, uh, it, it goes, travels in a kind of just one direction. Um, to to be to be filtered, so it can it be transmitted. But if it is in the isotropic phase, the light the light cannot be transmitted. So everything looks very dark in the isotropic phase, whereas in the nematic phase, everything looks very very bright. Uh, so so then uh, so we have these capillaries uh, filled with this mixture of liquid crystal with gold nanoparticles. The temperature was increased at a rate of one degree per minute, and then uh, well they took recordings of uh, both phase transitions. Is there anything of the setup experimental setup? Okay. So what were our questions? So of course, what observations can we recover? phase transition videos using our topological framework and what extra information we can obtain from this analysis. So uh, the first thing that we needed to do is try to compare to with this uh, what they observed with respect to what we are observing in this uh, in the persistence diagrams. So in here uh, at the bottom of this persistence diagrams, I am putting just an image of how this capillary look like and at different steps, three different steps of the uh, phase transition process. Uh, so the phase transition is as follows. So, uh, so here at the, in the left, I have uh, my molecules, which are like uh, these uh, ellipses uh, in, in purple. And in yellow, we have these uh, gold nanospheres uh, randomly distributed. When the uh, phase transition starts, then uh, the nanoparticles prefer to be in the more like uh, ordered uh, phase of the system. And after that, and so there, there will be created this, uh, 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 there will be a non-homogeneous uh, moment in which there will be a coexistence of pneumatic and isotropic uh, uh, phases in the capillary. And then if, when the temperature is high enough, uh, it reaches the, the temperature transition, then everything will be completely disordered. And so we have reach, uh, reached at that moment the uh, isotropic phase. So for instance, at the beginning, we just see a white, a white stripe in the middle, which is a very small. So uh, here, the, um, the size of this uh, uh, capillary is six micrometers. It's something very, very, very thin. And then, uh, so it, as, as, as we see at the beginning, because you know, it's just a, basically is a kind of trivial topology of the system. Uh, so we have a very small, like uh, uh, um, points in our, uh, or, or, points in our persistent diam diagram which have uh, whose life spans are very short. Yeah, so be, and this is just basically because there are going to be kind of like a um, flickering around uh, because we are kind of close to the phase transition. So in the middle of the phase transition, then we have this appearance of, so, so everything is, is just aligned and then everything at the middle of the phase transition, we have alternating zones of black and white, which means White is the pneumatic phase, the order phase, and black is the, when the, uh, the system in there is just completely isotropic, so no order at all. And these uh, basically are the, the pneumatic phases are kind of uh, uh, detected by these um, lifespans of uh, one cycles. Yeah, so we, we, they are kind of forming holes in our image. Uh, and then at the end of the phase transition, then basically everything is kind of going to die. So everything uh, re uh, is again like a, a, it's dark because the, the the light cannot be transmitted. And then so basically at the end, this basically uh, it looks like a, a empty almost uh, our persistent diagram. Ingrid, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. What's the degree of homology that you're computing? Is this zero? Uh, yeah, sorry, this is H1. H1 is the ones, uh, so we are H0 and H1. So uh, in case the blue one is just uh, H, uh, degree one. Mm -hmm. so, so can you repeat that? So which points are H0 and which points are H1 in these images? So in this image, the blue dots, I mean, I think we cannot see very well the red dots, which are very, very close to the diagonal. And, and so I try to, 
say with these uh, ellipses in red that they there are some uh, uh, yeah the connected components uh, are kind of like a, we can see all, all these classes corresponding to connected components in here, but these ones so they they are uh, the blue dots just uh, homology in degree one so that means that basically are we we when we fire by intensity we just see like a holes because uh, uh, at some point they do not exist until they reach uh, uh, the, la the the highest values mm -hmm. and okay uh, because of the the shape I mean is the the images are 2d right so this is maybe the highest degree of homology that makes sense yeah 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 exactly yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah, Thank you. because of this, this kind of, no problem. Yeah, because of this kind of filtration. So basically, we are just looking at, yeah, we might try to do other things. But yeah, at the moment, it's just this filtration. Okay, so uh, now, um, so, uh, is this, uh, are you using Vitoris list or some other complex? Sorry, uh, could you repeat the question? He asked if you're using Vitoris rips or some other complex. Oh, no, uh, so here, yeah, so we are using, no, it is not, it's just a filtration by uh, pixel intensity. It's kind of a Morse filtration, right? So no. So that uh, was that filtration yeah, so the, intensity yeah, exactly. of the image. So uh, yeah, we, we could use at some point, indeed, I'm not going to present it here, but we also did a uh, RIPS, RIPS filtration to measure, for instance, the periodicity in the system, which also was detected. So it's something I'm not going to present here, but it's possible also to do some kind of Viatorius uh, RIPS filtration for these images. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so now, um, so the idea now is that uh, we want to study some properties what can be described by uh, these uh, nice uh, um, uh, functions defined uh, by persistent homology. So one of them is, for instance, supramolecular heterogeneity of a molecular system. So it basically measures how far a configuration state of the system is from having a uniform order parameter. So again, the unit, the ordered parameter has to do, uh, it tells us how much, uh, well, they take values between, um, uh, it's a, a tensor, uh, if we think of a scalar, uh, approximate uh, our ordered parameter as a scalar, uh, this will take us between zero and one, and zero being uh, completely disordered and one completely ordered. So one could be something like a crystal and zero something like, a, for instance, a liquid, yeah? And in here, for molecules, uh, like in well, in a liquid crystal, so this value might uh, might have will be between say 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.6, something like that. And so, uh, if we measure, uh, and because it, the order parameter is a local property, so it might not be homogeneous in every place. In we, if we if we move along all the system, this 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 value will change. And so basically the formations of molecular clusters in different uh, kind of uh, arrangement will make that this parameter is not uniform in the whole system. And so somehow these we want to say that, well, this so molecular heterogeneity will tell us something about how much, how, how, how uniform or non-uniform our uh, order parameter is. Uh, 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 sorry, in this case, how, how uh, non-uniform the order parameter is. Okay, so uh, now la, we're trying to uh, keep track on this uh, supramolecular heterogeneity. This, this we can do it through the one norm. So the one norm is basically, in the case of the one norm, is just the sum of all the uh, life spans of this um, our um, cl uh, our classes in the persistent diagram. And so basically, uh, when when uh, there is not the supramolecular heterogeneity is constant, that means we are is uniform, it means that we are only in one uh, uh, surface, yeah? So the, the system and whatever we are measuring things, uh, the, the, um, the order parameter is not going to change. Uh, so here in this case, we start in a point, so this phase transition started on a point in which uh, before the, the, sometime earlier than the, beginning of the phase transition, so no, no change. And then it starts increasing, which means that these this, uh, things that I was showing here, uh, so it was completely trivial, so no change. 
And then there are some kind of breaking in, in the middle, so which means formation of clusters of molecules which are completely disordered. And that is what makes that this uh, uh, or the, uh, the heterogeneity of in our system is increases. Yeah. So it it is constant. Then there are many uh, in, uh, atropic cluster forming a lot until it reaches a maximum. And then uh, the heterogeneity starts decreasing because the uh, nematic uh, uh, zones are also start disappearing. So, so it's kind of a balance between appearance of and disappearance of uh, nematic and isotropic phases. And this is for the nematic to isotropic phase transition. And the, from the isotropic to nematic phase transition, which is the uh, system that was not studied, so this is already understood and, and well, there is a behavior which is completely is different. So we have kind of like a first a maximum, so it starts increasing, then decreases, it, it reaches a minimum, and then it starts increasing again, increasing again, and then decreases. So somehow, at some point, again, we can see that it is heterogeneous, then it becomes kind of homogeneous, but then heterogeneity, it starts increasing again until it decreases. And at this point, indeed, we have reached the, uh, the, uh, the transition to the isotropic phase. So something here is happening, and it is detected by one norm. Ingrid, can I ask a question from the yeah. uh, audience? So the yeah. question is uh, phrased as follows. So that uh, it seems like you're studying the path in the space of persistence barcodes or diagrams parameterized mm -hmm. by temperature. And the question was asking if that you could somehow state, I'm not sure if it means empirically or theoretically that there are no self intersections. In other words, that different temperatures don't have the same diagram. No, I mean, no. Um... Probably no, uh, at, at least with that, um, this, we might have, for instance, um, a, this is just a representation where we don't know if it is, you know, in or not. And, uh, and then, so we might have just, uh, uh, we are trying to get information from our observations and parameterized in, in the space of persistent diagram. But, uh, yeah, so we kind of need to corroborate uh, and try to look at what the, the uh, other experimental observations can support with what we see in the, for instance, in this description. Yeah, so I, I will go go a little bit, and maybe talk about later, or if there is any question I can answer later. Thank okay. You. Uh, so then uh, the idea is that uh, uh, we would like to uh, then say more things using this one norm. And one of these things is that uh, we uh, uh, have, we can uh, also detect, it helps us to detect uh, in phases, uh, one norm, uh, in moments uh, in which the, there is a completely pneumatic phase, completely isotropic phase or something in between. So in here, if we take, for instance, a long enough video, so before much earlier than, or well, at a temperature uh, um, uh, uh, below the, the phase transition, the, the starting of the phase transition, then we will see that there is no change in the one norm. And yeah, and this is kind of understandable. So no, there is no, the, uh, as I said, the texture in the image is not changing. And then it starts changing when uh, the one norm starts increasing, when this appearance of uh, some bubbles of uh, corresponding to uh, isotropic phases starts appearing. And, in, in, and then uh, when everything kinds of becomes again uh, uh, the, um, into um, isotropic phase, the uh, norm should be more or less constant. So this, the presence of this plateau, plateau talks about kind of like a, a, a phases which are kind of constant or uh, moments in which the system is not changing. Okay, so, um, and also we can kind of uh, detect time of coexistence and temperature of coexistence of these uh, pneumatic and isotropic phases. All can right. I ask a quick question about that? Yes. So, uh, if you, so it seems here the one norm is constant. Is there something about this that maybe isn't constant? Like if you were to inspect the images, would it be, would they look the same over those time periods? Sorry, say again, what, it looks like what? So the before and after the, the phases mm -hmm. of transition, you see a con it's, as you were saying, it's plateaus, uh, at least the one norm plateaus. 
if you were to look at the the underlying images themselves, do they look uh, constant? If you were to inspect them visually, yeah, visually you can see huh, exactly. So, so this is one of the things that we want to say. Yeah. So, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, people, you know, the way in which people measure this uh, moment, the beginning and the end of the phase transition, is by simple observation. As I mentioned, depends on the type of uh, of um, the system that you have, it might be very evident when things start becoming changing or might not be that evident and also will depend on your eye. No? So we wanted to say that even if you don't have, you know, you are not looking at the system, you can take, you know, let your system go, it evolves, and then take the recording and then look at it and, and having a, a, a really good, you know, uh, measurements of like the velocity at which you change the temperature and so on, you can really kind of like a uh, detect uh, the moment in which everything is started and ended. But yeah, in this case, yeah, it's it's possible to to, to find these differences. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess the, the question was sort of, if you imagine laying those two images on top of each other, uh -huh. like in the, in the same time period and then subtracting them, are we looking at something that's like going to be zero everywhere or? Yeah, is it so, yeah so you you mean like a take, thinking of uh, the image as a, as a vector? in a high dimensional yeah, space, yeah? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, this is other thing. We did it and mm. we didn't have the same results. So they really, indeed, I mean, uh, yeah, I couldn't talk about everything that we did, but we compare what persistent homology detects and what an analysis of just simple analysis of thinking of images or so living in some high dimensional space. And it is not as, as good as what we can get with persistent homology. That's yeah, that's really great. Very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Uh, okay, so now uh, what we do now is uh, uh, we want to compare configuration states using, for instance, bottleneck distance. I'm sorry, I think I'm going, uh, I'm up of my time, but uh, yeah, I will take some minutes to finish. Uh, so um, so I, I think I, I, we wanted to here to, to use uh, uh, this um, metric or distance to compare configurations. And what we can see again is like a difference between the pneumatic and isotropic. Uh, uh, and pneumatic to isotropic and isotropic to pneumatic phase transitions are different. So for instance, in here clearly we can see again when the system is in a very steady state. Yeah, so in here nothing is moving. So the distances are almost zero. So this color map is, is basically is the distance between uh, different points in time. Uh, with our images. And then at some point in here, which we can, this double tonic distance indeed, we can detect the moment in which everything appears, it starts occurring, the dynamical process starts. Then as the system starts evolving, it moves, it moves, it moves until it reaches a point in which it seems that it's going backwards. Yeah, so it seems like, a, at least in terms of the topology, we might think that this coincides of with the one norm that we are observing. So it's the, 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 the system is changing structurally a lot, but then at some point, because of this, uh, at the pneumatic and isotropic phase transition, topologically, we look the same. So we, if we forget about intensities, they will look more or less the same. So that's why this kind of like uh, tells us that something is going backwards. Uh, in terms of the topology. Um, and on the other hand, now it seems that there is a kind of like a, the system is going backwards twice. So it's moving away, then goes back, then moves away, and then goes back again. So something is different in here. And then, of course, we, we get at the steady state, which is the pneumatic state. But yeah, I mean, we with this might not be very visible what's going on. So what we wanted to do is then study the, uh, uh, this uh, um, phase transition, uh, uh, the, the, this, the, the pathway in uh, embedding. And this is how it looks. So this allows us to see that, for instance, this one, this looks like it has is doing a kind of double loop, something like this. Uh, and this, again, the color map is given by time. So it starts here, it moves, it moves away, then it goes away again, and then it comes back. And whereas in here, it moves away, and then it goes back. not exactly to the same place, but something closer. And in this case, well, this is uh, when we embed both in the in the Euclidean space, we can see that this is a non-reversible uh, 
process. So that means that when we go away from pneumatic to isotropic, and then we want to go back again to the pneumatic state, the path that the system is following is not the same for the one in which it arrived to the uh, uh, isotropic state. So that talks about the irreversibility and we kind of like a consistent again with what it's observed in, in, the two, in the one norm. Now, what can we do in order to see what's going on? Uh, what happens now in terms of the dynamics, uh, we can now, we, we try to study the velocity of the first uh, coordinate in our embedding. Um, so in here, for instance, we have the pneumatic and uh, to isotropic in which the system moves very quickly, then it stays uh, like a for some minutes, like a here, just jumping a bit and then moving away. But in here, the isotropic to pneumatic looks more like a more like a moving more. But there is a point in which it seems to be steady and then moves quickly away. So we wanted to study then this, uh, uh, the values of the zero. So here uh, it means that the, this system is kind of reaching a zero velocity. And, and somehow this should be kind of related also to, to the curvature. And now when we study the curvature, we see that there are three points, three main, uh, again, kind of three uh, uh, critical points for this curvature. And this one is basically corresponds to this moment in which the system seems to be happy to be for some time in, 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 this, in this zone. And now if we take the, 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 the images corresponding to these critical points, these correspond to these uh, three images. So uh, the dark, uh, the red uh, color means it's very bright. And again, uh, blue color is very, very dark. So here, the copy is just this inside of this uh, two uh, small stri stripe. And this point number two is precisely the moment in which you are saying that the, the system is reaching a kind of homogeneous state. Yeah, uh, the supramolecular homogeneity, heterogeneity of the system is a minimum, well, or a, a relative minimum, yeah. Uh, so, and then after that, in the point number three, it seems that the system is breaking away apart again. So with all this information, what can we conclude? So what we conclude is that the interactions at the boundary, so getting information from other similar system, uh, it seems that the interactions at the surface seems to be important so that the system uh, starts, a, there is a kind of two-step process in which first the phase transition at the surface of the capillary, and then after that, uh, it uh, the system completely transformed into an pneumatic uh, into into isotropic state in the bulk. Okay, so uh, quickly then the conclusions for this study is that uh, we uh, our persistent homology tracks the evolution of a liquid crystal in the out equilibrium phase transition. Um, we of course we think that the, we can map the thermodynamical potential the pathway followed uh, by a liquid crystal. Uh, into a pathway in, uh, in the space of persistent diagrams. Uh, we can detect several uh, features uh, which will, will be important to describe the dynamic of our system. And, and also I, we think that this methodology is not only uh, to, uh, uh, cannot be, uh, can be extended to the study of not just liquid crystal, but other soft matter, uh, con set, soft condensed matter system. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. So let's briefly unmute ourselves and applaud quietly for the speaker. <laughs> Further questions for Ingrid? I have a quick question. Um, thanks for your talk, Ingrid. It's really an interesting project that you're doing. Um, can you help me understand? So you did a lot with the one norm. Um, what was your thought process or why did you pick that norm? Oh, yeah, so um, indeed, yeah. So basically, uh, we wanted to understand uh, or try to play with the tools that persistent homology uh, gives you. And indeed, it was kind of more like, uh, you know, see what we get. And then uh, compared with what we uh, found, we, what, what we was already studied, and then with that understand what did that one norm was measuring. Yeah. So somehow it's like uh, 
uh, because again, if we think of a norm, again, as a norm of a vector, so we know that always these this norm are meaningful in the study of whatever system, velocity, energy, uh, whatever. So the scalar value will be important. So at that particular, uh, in our case, thinking of a norm, this norm as a, something that has a physical meaningful was kind of the, comparing to, to the systems that we study in Euclidean space is what, yeah allows to, to use it. Thanks. Further questions? I just have one kind of meta question. So I'm interested in um, some of the uses and successes of, of persistent homology in uh, chemistry and material science. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you mentioned that, that, that homology gave you some information, some insights that you couldn't get by treating it as like a vector and doing a standard analysis. Why do you, if you have a maybe a high level of thought, why do you think that topological methods are giving insights that standard techniques uh, maybe can't or haven't yet? Oh, I guess it's because of the dimensions in which we are working, right? So dimensions of these images are very, very big. Yeah, so somehow maybe you could really need a lot of points really to describe things in a very nice way. So uh, kind of topological methods you don't need. For instance, uh, our images say there were um, of the size, I don't know, say maybe, uh, 90,000 um, uh, pixels, so something like that. So imagine, so you needed to map that image to a vector of that dimension. So it's kind of like a very big, so you really maybe lose some information just thinking about the dimensions that you needed to use to describe the system. Whereas in this case, for instance, in persistent homology, we know that, well, you have a, um, uh, a given number of points, which is, I don't know, say a thousand points or whatever number of frames that we have. And then we can uh, obtain, a, 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 say, an Euclidean embedding with, will have at most this kind of uh, number of dimensions. So, yeah, so, and also because we, you know, it gives shapes. So the fact that we have shapes there, with the fact that you have molecules that form some kind of aggregates and keep seeing that aggregates become important when you want to describe something in between solid and liquid is that also let us thought that maybe we should think more of our topological methods that's really interesting thanks for your insight more questions uh, yeah actually i have a question um so I'm from UW Medicine and I'm actually working on a very similar system. So we're looking at LC dynamics, um, but going from anchoring transitions. So like uh, homeotropically anchored vertically to planar. And so we get very similar sort of dynamics in our liquid crystal mm -hmm. systems. And so, um, so actually what, what we've been looking at is um, looking at these systems by using the Euler characteristic curve rather than uh, the mm -hmm. full persistence diagram. And I'm wondering if you guys had tried looking at the Euler characteristic curve as opposed to the full uh, diagram itself? Uh, well, and no, I mean, for instance, we could uh, think about, you know, uh, also given uh, our curve, uh, we might think of studying through um, embedded again, kind of do our ribs filtrations and growing balls. Uh, around points and then see, for instance, if we can have holes or something like that. Uh, but uh, our idea was more like a try to uh, look more at the shape so that it and the velocity, because it got, as I mentioned, it will give us an insight of where the system likes to live more. And so basically those points in which, for instance, velocity is zero, it, it might mean that the system is it, it reaches either a stable state or a metastable state. Now, in terms of curvature, also it will tell you about if you are crossing through uh, hills or to valleys or something that in, indeed tells you that there might exist some kind of uh, um, a critical point in associated to to this uh, the, the to the system. 
Uh, but yeah, that, I mean, there are still plenty of tools in topology that can be used for sure to, to understand the dynamics of the system. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then I guess uh, one follow up question would be um, so when we look at our liquid crystal systems, right, they have like an RGB color space that they can sit in. Um, and you said that you were looking at the systems through grayscale. And I was yeah. wondering if you had looked at any other color spaces, like yeah. LED spaces or anything like that. Yeah, so we, we basically, uh, we try to do, you know, uh, we uh, choose uh, our uh, just projected into, for instance, I don't know, red, green and blue, and also grayscale. But I think that, uh, again, it's, it's kind of a play with try and, and error. So try to see which one gives you kind of the allows to distinguish more. So in some cases, for instance, if your image is uh, red and, and, and it has colors red and, 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 and green, then a grayscale is not going to work. So, so in that case, then you need to choose another linear combination. But of course, uh, we might try to do that. In our case, grayscale work OK. But yes, it's it's another possibility, and yeah. So we now we are working with other system that we are using a different, uh, different uh, uh, color. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. We have time for maybe one more question, if there are any. Well, thanks so much, Ingrid, for a fantastic talk. And thanks, everybody, for joining today and for the nice questions. Much.